I V M. Welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories, India's very own travel podcast, where each week we share the journey of travelers in their own words and relive their experiences with you, our listeners. Hey guys, welcome to a brand new episode of the Musafir Stories. Hope you're all well and keeping safe. On the podcast today, we have Udbhav Agarwal, author of the book A for Prayagraj. a short biography of Allahabad. We talked to Udbhav about his love for Allahabad, a brief history of the place, as well as some interesting snippets from his book. As a part of the episode, we're giving away two copies of Udbhav's book. All you have to do is listen to the episode and answer three simple questions linked in the description of the episode. Good luck and let's get on with the episode now. We know you love fast food. Fast fashion. Faster payment. Lightning fast internet speed. Then why not fast information? On Think Fast where we discuss the latest developments in the world of technology, business, marketing, pop culture. With a side of sarcasm and my dad jokes. Not just mine. Not mine, Varun. My jokes are funny. So join me guys, the funnier one, Suchita Salwan, co-founder of LBB. And me, Varun Dugirala, the co-founder of The Glitch as we think fast only on the IBM network. Fresh episodes out every Monday. On the IBM app, website or wherever you get your podcast from. So with that introduction, we'd love to welcome Udbhav Agarwal, author and a PhD candidate to the Musafir Stories. Udbhav, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast and welcome. Thank you for having me. Udbhav, thank you so much for being a part of the podcast. And uh, yeah, I introduced you as author and a PhD candidate. And if people are wondering why we have um, Udbhav on the podcast, uh, that is because uh, Udbhav's uh, debut book is about a wonderful city. And that's what we'll be discussing about today. Uh, but before that, Udbhav, the introduction I gave about you was uh, pretty short and concise. So why don't you speak a little bit more about yourself and then we can hop on and talk a little bit more about your book as well. Sure, sure, sure. Uh, as a step already said, my name is Udbhav. Um, I was born in Allahabad, India, and I stayed in the city uh, till when I was 13. And then I went to boarding school in India for a few years. And then I came to the US um, for my undergrad. And I've been here for about, well, eight years now. And over the years, as I've kind of moved in and out of Allahabad, returned to the city or moved away from it, I've always tried to figure out what my connection to the city was. the culmination of all those journeys is uh, what led to this book that we're talking about wonderful thanks so much udbhav and yeah really eagerly looking forward to this as well especially when it is um, these iconic cities right it's always very hard <laughs> to cover them off in a podcast episode right uh, you can't really do justice to all of them and even in the book i'm sure uh, you might have found that challenge yeah. as well that it's always so hard but again uh, we look at it from your perspective your experience and what you felt uh, all of these years living there and your journeys back to Allahabad even while you've been away from it as well um can you give a brief synopsis about the book as well i know you mentioned that it's about your uh, journeys but at a high level like what was the thought process mm-hmm. or when did you come up with this idea that hey i i think i have to jot down my thoughts and make a, like make this into a book I think because as anyone who kind of you know is born somewhere and lives there and actually ends up leaving that place Uh, I think there's a very uh, strange kind of relationship that you form uh, with the places that you leave behind. And for me, when I, you know, went to boarding school first, but then more so when I came to America, I was not sure what my relationship to Allahabad was, and I didn't simply want to, you know, leave it at some kind of nostalgia or some kind of, you know, NRI syndrome of just like appreciating uh, or exoticizing these places. So that was, you know, one of the first impulses where I was like, hey, there is this. background this this past to me which i don't really know how to relate to uh, or how to make sense of and with that i was you know kind of starting to write some stories on alhabar uh, just like minor anecdotes that i picked up here and there in conversations when i was in america so that was happening on one side and then i was also studying sociology and political science and so when time came for me to you know write a thesis for my undergraduate uh, senior year in my undergrad 
I found myself returning to Allahaba from a more um, sociological lens. And that was the time when uh, a lot of the uh, political landscape in India was changing. You know, uh, far right was coming up. There was a lot of uh, re-scripting of Allahaba. The narrative around Allahabad was changing. Uh, eventually, the name of the city would change. Actually, I found an in back into Allahabad, into this past that I had kind of left behind through these uh, seismic changes in its fabric and in its culture. And as I, you know, went back uh, to research for my thesis, uh, interviewing people, uh, that kind of sparked off a very, uh, it turned out that uh, I was unlocking parts of me in that journey, uh, which I wasn't aware of, just reconciling things uh, that I never really uh, considered. Mm-hmm. that the the political and the personal kind of started merging together. Eventually, I you know, ended up writing a proposal for a book uh, to Aleph, who has this beautiful city series, and it got accepted, and I got you know a chance to explore that more fully and more comprehensively, uh, these lines. Yeah. Yeah, wonderful. And yeah, definitely does make a lot of sense as well, especially when you're living in a place you don't tend to think as much about it like that's what I've, mm-hmm. I've always felt about Bangalore as well when you're there you don't uh, and not just yeah. places I guess with a lot of things right even with people when you're with them you don't tend to appreciate them as much but when you tend to like be away from them or get away from them that's when like you try start like reminiscing a lot of those things and um, like trying to think more deeply about what that place or that person meant to you right so Really, really uh, looking forward to this conversation as well. And before we get too deep into the conversation, assuming one some some of us living under a rock don't know where Allahabad is, <laughs> Udbhav, uh, would you please educate us a little bit about uh, the place itself, where Allahabad is situated? So Allahabad is usually associated with Eastern UP. Uh, you can you know sense it in the language that's spoken there. It's very dis- different from Western UP uh, and the Leheza and every, all of that. Um, but the big thing about Allahabad that you know a lot of people uh, know it for is that it's uh, situated in the intersection of two rivers. Mm-hmm. Uh, so Ganga and Yamuna they meet at Allahabad and they kind of form a cradle for the city. Historically, that has also been the region has been very fertile. It's one of the things which uh, I begin the book by saying that that people would come here would always set in its geography because. It's always fertile. You kind of always expected people will come here. Yeah. yeah, and I mean, it's now we've just had a new airport come into the city. So it's become very connected, which is surprising for, you know, such an important city. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, definitely. Very, very accessible and very well connected. So getting there should not be a problem either via roadways, railways, or like what Puff said, uh, now the airport. Um, again, uh, just going back to your point about... Um, this being a very historic and iconic city, right? Even over time, and it's also been known as one of the longest living uh, living cities as well. Um, would you like to tell us a little bit more about the history of the place as well? And uh, you kind of touched upon the recent name change in 2018 to um, from Allahabad to Prayagraj, but this is not the first yeah. time that there has been name changes in yeah. the past as well. So do you want to give us a little bit uh, background about the history of Allahabad or Prayag, as it was known. So, Allahabad is one of the oldest living cities in the world, one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in the mm-hmm. world. Uh, it's often kind of paired with Banaras, Varanasi, in the same, uh, you know, associated with the same kind of past. The first mentions of inhabitants in Allahabad dates back to like, I think, 1000 BCE in the Rigved. What is important about that time is that uh, the city as we know it right now didn't really exist then. It was just a kind of small strip of uh, kutiyas and uh, just riverbed settlements mm-hmm. uh, with a lot of munis and uh, there was a lot of religious activity there. Right. So that is uh, that was like the oldest avatar of Allahabad and it is then from there we get the name uh, Prayag mm-hmm. which is actually referring to Yag, the ritual right. and it was believed that uh, Lord Brahma had performed these Yagyas here, mm-hmm. Das Yagya. So that's where the name Prayag comes from. And then over the years, you know, as you uh, as you have this, you know, different dynasties uh, coming to the area, no one actually uh, settles in Allahabad in the region right. of where the two rivers are meeting. There's a lot of people are settling, like the Guptas and all, uh, set nearby and they make trips to Allahabad, this this area specifically, but they do not start living here. It's only with the Mughals and specifically with Akbar right. that, that 
a kind of city as we know it today starts forming and Akbar gives it the name of uh, Allahabad mm-hmm. which is uh, a very interesting uh, name because a lot of times people confuse it uh, because when the British came they started calling Allahabad not Allahabad mm-hmm. so they uh, sort of connoted with uh, Allah in some reason but Allahabad actually has a more broader right. meaning which is just a reference to the supreme power so Allahabad is where the supreme power lives so that's what akbar called it, the city and uh, there was a lot of uh, mogal and sufi architecture that came up during that time and he really took it upon himself to kind of develop alhabad as we know it mm-hmm. and then of course alhabad uh, becomes uh, a big 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 node in uh, the british colonial administration right. it becomes the capital of the north uh, provinces this is the kind of cerebellum of uh, where the british uh, in some rule a big part of the colonial india right. and so when they are coming in uh, there's a lot of uh, restructuring of the city and a remapping of the city so what was initially very uh, smallish but very uh, full of character boroughs or neighborhoods and villages even some of them are actually burnt down by the british and built over mm-hmm. and then you have this design which is you know of course repeated in a lot of uh, cities in the colonies where you have this area called the white town right. and then the other areas so now when you come to alhabad you see a little bit of the uh, mogal architecture in spurts but the big uh, kind of the way the city is mapped is the british way uh, so there is uh, all the colonial administrations the huge colonial bungalows the company garden which is you know kind of the centerpiece of the city in some ways uh, and then right outside the the company gardens and the railway tracks on one side you have those uh other previous ways of organizing city spaces so very tight very uh congested small serpentine streets in different neighborhoods so yeah it is seen a lot the city has seen a lot and after the british of course it also becomes a big seat of uh rebellion against the british mm-hmm. so the gandhis are here the nehrus are here it's a hotbed of political activity and you know after independence of course it's a story of steady and a slow decline from all of that mm-hmm. to this kind of a very anonymous looking town like now if you come to alhabad it with the malls and with the shopping complexes and uh, you kind of see that personality of the city even its architecture and its space is uh, dwindling and disappearing so that's like a short and sweet <laughs> past of the city yeah one of the key i guess features or the characteristics of the city also has been this intersection of the two rivers right ganga yamuna and the uh, invisible saraswati and uh, the sangam as they say right triveni sangam as they call it that has been yeah. one of the key features and obviously during the later times with the uh, moguls or akbar actually setting up camp here and also uh, jahangir was one of them um, you know, stayed here for a little bit so all of that influence resulted in the confluence no, not just of the two rivers but also the different kinds of people coming from uh, different areas right so it's given mm-hmm. rise to this very unique concept called as this ganga jamuni tehzeeb right would you mm-hmm. give touched upon that in the book as well but would you like to uh, kind of enlighten us a little bit more about the, this concept as well above yeah definitely i mean uh, that was one of the most fascinating things about alhabad's uh, fabric of the city but basically that the tehzeeb was really just a way of uh, people belonging to different religious identities kind of uh, being thrust together in the same spaces and uh, then finding a way to live with each other and what was astonishing is that uh, there was a way in which uh, they could be of their religion but also be of the other religion in a very interesting way so there were like you know there'd be like small etiquettes or practices that would make the relationship between these two groups of people very uh, convivial and uh, syncretic in some ways so i mean in the book i following the story of this uh, person uh, akshat lal elhabadi mm-hmm. who has these stories of how uh, the chowk area of elhabad which is one of the you know one of the oldest areas of the city which came up a lot in the uh, during the mogal time how hindus and muslims kind of live there and how like rituals for instance like the tazia that's lifted is funded by a hindu family how uh, uh, akshat's grandfather was given uh, 
a Muslim name uh, and was referred to by that name uh, for the longest time in his life. So these small, small things that uh, signal a kind of coming together of these two uh, cultures almost right. and kind of getting fully agreed onto each other. And uh, that came to be known as Tehzeeb. And of course, the metaphor of the rivers coming together was very important to kind of describe these two cultures meeting. Mm-hmm. And even now you can sense it in the language, uh, Hindi and Urdu are just mixing together in the food. So it's kind of uh, inseparable almost. Yeah, yeah, definitely, especially the stories like you mentioned, right? The Chokki mm-hmm. Holi to the Muharram procession uh, being flagged off yeah. by the Hindu family in the area. Like all of those are really heartening stories and it's great to actually hear from you and obviously you sp- Uh, in turn speaking with the locals and the people who have been living and experiencing this over several decades, right? So that's really heartening and uh, gives a sense of this uh, Ganga Jamni Tehzeeb, which is very unique, I would say. I know perhaps this occurs across a lot of other places in Mm -hmm. um, India as well, where uh, people of different religions are living together. But in Allahabad, right, this blooms and really shows up beautifully too so i'm glad that mm-hmm. was captured beautifully in the book uh, and i really love i have to call this out <laughs> even before we get too deep into the conversations that uh, i love the wordplay and the way you've named all the different chapters in the book <laughs> uh, for somebody who's just looking at it um, might not make a, lo- a lot of sense but once you start reading it and how the chapter names are connected to stories within the book it's mm-hmm. great and this first one by the way is Mekalu Tiki which kind of shows <laughs> the confluence of cultures and also times in uh, to some mm-hmm. extent right so uh, we'll continue to make these uh, wonderful references as we go through the conversation um, now just touching upon uh, we touch upon the Ganga Jamuni Tehzee but one of the other important important and uh, really um, unique uh, again you know, unique in a way that um, it, it is one of the largest gathering of people for a religious ceremony of sorts right um, the mm-hmm. kummela that also is very very uh, iconic and special to the sp- uh, to the place to the city and do you want to touch a little bit more upon that as well because I mean, uh, very unique in the sense that one happens once every 12 years and uh, it also has a mm-hmm. unique backstory as to how the name came about as well. Do you want to touch upon that, Udbhav? Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, Kumila is actually, uh, as we know it right now, uh, it's not uh, too old. It's only been happening for a few hundred years. Mm-hmm. And uh, there's an essay in uh, Arvind Krishna Mehrotra's book, The Last Bhaglo, which kind of uh, excavates this past of the Kumila. But the name really comes from this uh, myth of uh, the churning of the ocean, mm-hmm. where the, you know, the demons and the lords were churning the ocean and the uh, pot that they were, you know, that was in the middle of the churning kind of fell and it's believed to have uh, spilled Amrit mm-hmm. in Allahabad. So uh, that's where the name Kumb, Kumb is the name for the pot, right. uh, comes from. Um, and now, I mean... Uh, in the recent years, especially this last iteration, there were about 150 million people who attended. Yeah. And literally uh, in the winter time, when the kind of river water, the river really kind of uh, is not as voluminous, mm-hmm. an entire city is built on the riverbeds. The, the, like sanitation, camps, electricity, everything, food, everything is, it's a very self-sufficient city. And of course, you have all these pilgrims coming in. Um, and it was at the same time becoming extremely commercialized. Mm-hmm. So it almost felt like it was an amusement park of sorts where, uh, you know, you have these like advertisements for like Pepsi and other brands. Uh, and then you have all these attractions from the religious past to the city. So like you go to this tent and watch this sadhu mm-hmm. perform this trick or that trick or something like that. So these two things happening simultaneously was, uh, I felt was a kind of uh, lessening of the religiosity and replacing it with a kind of commercialized branding mm-hmm. of what this was meant to be. Uh, but yeah, that's that's what Scum was about. Yeah, and it's uh, interesting, I think, uh, to get a perspective. Uh, obviously, uh, somebody who's visiting it for the first time might not be able to make mm-hmm. this relative comparison. But it's uh, interesting to hear this from you as well over time, right, over your previous visits, how this is kind of slowly metamorphosized and I guess in a way also keeping up at times, I guess, right? Uh, yeah. In general, like a lot of these things are also things we do see across, right, commercialization to uh, other things we see playing out, be it the politics or whatever it is. Uh, mm-hmm. It's interesting to see that 
it shows in pretty much every aspect of life, uh, including the comb. Yeah. Uh, the other important thing that also like first comes to mind, um, like obviously important personalities of Allahabad too, right? Uh, like you mentioned, it's always been like at the fore and at the center of a lot of activity, be it from the times from Akbar or later on during the independence struggle as well. So a lot of lot of key movements have been involved in this area too, right from um, mm-hmm. Gandhiji starting his marches to even people like Chandrasekhar Azad, right? Uh, right mm-hmm. here in the city. Some of those have been touched upon in the book too. Do you want to call out perhaps some of the examples and that's uh, touched upon in the book, Udbhav, because this is very, very key, Just not just in terms of the place, but even some of the personalities that have come out of the place, right? As I was saying earlier, that Allahabad has, you know, been, uh, was not only an important node of British administration, but also an important center of the reaction to that and kind of uh, uh, the march towards independence right after independence for like maybe 30 years because it was um, such an important place from where the uh, country was being governed a lot of people came here and settled here and there was a really kind of uh, vibrant uh, political cultural life of the city so there was from the politics point of view there was so much uh, of course Nehru and Gandhi were here and uh, their uh, the Nehru house is still there Anand Bhavan mm-hmm. which is beautifully preserved even now uh, but apart from that there were a lot of uh, big writers like Farag Gorakhpuri, like Upendranath Ashk, who were also based here, like Mahadevi Verma. And of course, the uh, freedom fighters, more uh, like militant ones, Chandrasekhar Azad was here. He was actually uh, shot in the company garden yep. in Allahabad. And his pistols kept in the museum in company garden as well. And even the tree where he shot, it's marked and, you know, it's uh, monumentalized to him. So yeah, there's there are a lot of, I mean, uh, that was one of the most difficult parts about the book actually was to find a way to navigate this uh, rich cast of characters. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's just a never-ending cast of characters almost. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Very, very important places. And uh, even I believe when the actual handing over of the the reins to, from the British East India Company to the government, right? The British government happened, Mm -hmm. that also happened here, right? At the Minto Park, I understand. So a lot, a lot of um, key events places and people all coming out of this area um, and also just touching upon uh, the literary history of the place too and the personalities involved your uh, chapter three i guess right the chapter yeah. on um, is this Baketi? yeah i think Baketi yes. is the one yep. that touches upon a lot of the uh, literary history of the place a lot of um, important names uh, you did uh, mention in passing a couple of them uh, but the important one is about this uh, can I say immigrant author <clears throat> whose yes. biography you're um, going almost on a treasure hunt of right uh, can you mm-hmm. give us a quick peek into that that chapter and that story and your experience uh, going around uh, trying to find this mm-hmm. copy as well so, uh, as I was saying, Allahabad has been home to a lot of uh, lot of great literary personalities. But the one person that I was very drawn to was this uh, writer who immigrated to Allahabad. His name is Obedinath Ashk. He came here from Punjab. And he was not really accepted in the community of writers here. Mm-hmm. He was also to be blamed for it. I mean, he was uh, volatile, very... Uh, expressively angry at people and discouraging, not discouraging, but criticizing people's writing. So part of it was him, part of it was this kind of Hindi literary establishment, not accepting a writer from Punjab who's writing in a Punjabi inflected Hindi. But he really left a lot of books behind, uh, a big, big oeuvre of writing. And what was fascinating to me was that uh, he has this series of books about this writer, Chetan, his fictional character, five-volume uh, series. It's called Girti Diwari on Foreign Walls. And in that, there is one, the second book in that series is called Sheher Me Ghumta Aina, In the City, A Mirror Wandering, which is this massive 500-600 uh, page book. Uh, set in a single day of this writer's life. So that was something that I was very fascinated by, is like how uh, much detail and minutiae he can, as a writer, he's able to kind of excavate that writer book of 500 pages set in a single day. So that really struck me. And uh, then I wanted to read more about him. And I found out in one of my interviews that uh, he has also left a five-volume autobiography called Chehre Anek, of Faces of Plenty. Mm -hmm. So I I, uh, decided that I'll go find this autobiography and read more about him. I found out that 
not a lot of the bookstores in the city uh, either knew about the book and none of them actually had it. Mm. Uh, so I went to bookstores, I went to libraries, I went to old presses. In doing that, what I also found was uh, the state of this literary uh, landscape of the city mm-hmm. was uh, actually very discouraging. The uh, bookstores, they, their stocks weren't updated for years. The books were just, you know, gathering dust. There was barely anyone to actually buy a book. A lot of them, people were there to just, you know, prepare for some competitive exams or something, finding those books. And what was also striking was that this uh, new generation of uh, people who were occupying these spaces uh, were actually not in Allahabad to stay in Allahabad. Mm-hmm. They were coming into the city for their education or for a job or something, and they'd almost always leave the city uh, to go seek better opportunities, which was striking from uh, you know someone like Ashk, who had just uh, migrated and spent a lot of his life here. Ultimately, I kind of uh, found uh, his uh, grandson's number. I called him and then he was going to return my call. And after a long time, I finally found the autobiography. But sort of that journey of like going around in that day, trying to find his uh, autobiography and commenting on the state of these uh, libraries and uh, presses and uh, booksellers used to be so lively at one point, just uh, kind of uh, disappearing. That was very interesting to me. Yeah, definitely. It does give, uh, like you mentioned, a sense of the literary landscape. And uh, one that has been, I guess, a sort of a theme, right, has been very, very rich in the past. But slowly mm-hmm. you're saying uh, the current day scenario is something very different and people just focused on competitive exams and things like that and not really on the rich literary uh, history and the personalities that have been coming out of the place, right? Right from the uh, important names like you mentioned now to even um, Mahadevi Varma and even uh, Amitabh Bachchan's father, right? Yep. Mm-hmm. Rai Bachchan. All of those uh, important names are coming from this very city and uh, just kind of moving a little bit further into the book as well, um, you do in a lot of these other chapters that are there uh, through your conversations, throw some light on the current state of affairs as well, right? Um, mm-hmm. Apna Time Aiga, for example, is another chapter where you shed some light on education and employment or the lack of it, perhaps. A couple of quite, uh, very interesting chapters that I found in the book also that I'd like to touch upon uh, Udbhav is one, Samdam Gan Bhed, right? Uh, yeah. You know, a takeoff on <laughs> Sam Dam Dan Bhed, yes. right? Yeah. So that one was a very interesting one and also, I guess, gives a sense of the bureaucracy and corruption to mm-hmm. some sense, right? So that's one. And uh, the other one was uh, First Afyar or First Afirakh. That was also very interesting. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I didn't quite get the Farakh reference until I realized that yeah, there is the connection to the poet as well. And obviously, uh, view of the queer see you know the queer community mm-hmm. in Allahabad how that is so very interesting chapters too uh, any quick thoughts on those see Samdam Ganbhed was really like I wanted to take this because Allahabad used to be a big you know bureaucratic center and you have all these like legends about how uh, fair and just Allahabad's bureaucrats were and of course Allahabad has the high court of UP mm-hmm. even now I mean Allahabad's high court is always in the news for some landmark cases and all of that, but uh, so I wanted to get a sense of uh, how this underbelly of Allahabad, how uh, criminals and lawyers and businessmen they all come together and form this like kind of uh, network which really influences uh, people's lives in the city. Uh, and so, uh, you know, in for people who read the book, they'll find I've spoken to. Uh, criminal lawyers who are protecting, uh, you know, members of parliament who are also dons. I've spoken to uh, this uh, villager who becomes this big uh, silt business person who comes in to challenge the authority of, you know, this mafia don, MP figures. Mm -hmm. And what I found actually about that whole thing was that there was a way in which all of this made the city space very masculine. You had to be a certain kind of aggressive or a certain kind of uh, macho. Mm to kind of fit in the cityscape uh, with these characters, which I was also trying to bring out. That was Sam Nam Gan Bhed. And uh, as you were saying, the other chapter, uh, F for Fyar, First of Firak, was really about, uh, inspired from Firak Gorokhpuri, who was this uh, queer poet and professor in Allahabad University, interspersing his uh, couplets mm. 
uh, his beautiful love couplets that uh, you know he was writing to his lover how young people find love in the city mm-hmm. or try to find love in the city and uh, that took me into a very uh, almost a very different experience of city space where uh, because i was uh, tracking queer love stories one thing you find is that the very publicness of a city tries to work against you as you try to find some sense of privacy mm-hmm. uh, to get by your business so it was interesting is that a you'd think that you know it's very difficult to like find those spaces which it is but at the same time as i was uncovering stories on chat rooms on dating apps and stuff like that i found that even the most uh, public spaces were uh, also sites of uh, this where desires being expressed where people are you know expressing their love and stuff so the planetarium for instance when the planetarium show begins one couple was telling me that that's the time when they actually they sit in the hall and when the hall goes dark they uh, try find a time to caress each other there or when they're eating chaat somewhere you know they'll just uh, uh take an extra second to feed each other a gold cup and these small small things which you know a kind of reclaiming of the city space for the love story which was very interesting yeah definitely it's very beautifully captured and uh, uh, a lot of the references you've made in the in these two chapters as well right it's uh, it definitely does make a really good and breezy read through you don't really feel like you have uh, lost track anywhere it's uh, all very well connected and very well presented and uh, a lot of these stories are also tied really well so that um, keeps the reader and in this case the listener engaged um a couple of the quick things i'd also like to call out as we uh, kind of start to wrap up with some of the other important spots within the city as well we can't always forget about food <laughs> yeah wherever yeah. you go whatever it is uh, especially we indians we cannot forget about food so uh, do you want to call out some of the important and uh, yeah in few cases even iconic uh, eateries and spots that are popular in allahabad No definitely i mean uh, alhabad has a big 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 uh, fooding culture and people love to eat in mm-hmm. alhabad a few places that just dog my head uh, you definitely if you're visiting alhabad uh, should make a visit to coffee house mm-hmm. it's one of those places with whose where the flavor of uh, you know the sambar or uh, of course it's like serving all these uh, english breakfast staples along with south indian food mm-hmm. uh so it is always interesting but the flavor really hasn't changed in years i mean i've been going there since i was maybe 3 or 4 and i think the the flavor is still stays the same uh so coffee house is a great place to visit then when you go to chowk alhabad uh, there are at least two places there's this place called hari mm-hmm. uh and there's this place called sulaki sweets and uh the famous hari is famous for its samosas and kachoris sure. and even now i mean random people i meet even in baltimore where i am <laughs> and they get to know that i'm from alhabad and they're like oh can you bring me a hari ka samosa next time you come here <laughs> uh so you know the huge huge places uh, hari and sulaki uh, and of course i uh, have to mention uh, this bakery called el chico mm. which uh, is really really old was the first bakery of its kind in this area so a lot of people from banaras kanpur lucknow still crave the el chico buffets it it is a big uh, landmark in people's minds when it comes to alhabad's food scene and of course if you get to try chaat somewhere in alhabad you should give yourself the pleasure of having chaat in alhabad yeah yeah definitely the khao gali is uh, popularly known yeah. as <laughs> make sure if you're visiting alhabad you try out some of those and um yeah how can we forget without a mention of the alhabadi pan as well right uh, oh yeah <laughs> and yeah. that's something that uh, you've not forgotten to call out in the book too So thank you for that. Uh, Lapadi pan is also very very popular. Uh, as is the amrood, right? It's uh, fruits yeah. are also very popular and amrood actually stands out and uh, a lot of it that's exported from India is from Allahabad and uh, kind of goes back and ties back to that culture of the, uh, I guess from the time of the Mughals, right? Having these baghs mm-hmm. and uh, especially the Khusro bagh and the places around yeah. and all of that. All in all a uh, lovely journey and uh, just takes you it's also literally trip down not just memory lane but it was also i'd say almost like time travel right uh, you're starting mm-hmm. off back from the ages just making the connections to uh, how the city's name came about uh, how it's been inhabited for the longest time from those times to the more recent 
times of Tinder and Grindr and everything, right? It's actually mm-hmm. a good um, uh, just trip down, not just the memory lane, but also a little bit of a time travel. And the great part for me was um, I usually, um, I don't <laughs> often read books that are very thick and voluminous. And this is such a breezy read mm-hmm. that I could finish it off in a couple of settings. I think that was a great part too. So thank you so much, Udbhava, and uh, thank you for coming and sharing that with our listeners as well. And uh, like we were discussing at the beginning, we'll also figure a way out to give a few copies of the book to some of our listeners too. So we'll definitely figure that out. But for somebody who's looking to uh, keep in touch, and is there more books coming down the line? Or uh, what is the plan now? I know you said you're uh, pursuing a PhD now, but uh, how does it look like from here? Yeah, I mean, uh, I definitely want to write another book. I don't know when I will be able to write one, but I have, I have been thinking about writing a uh, a bigger book on UP mm-hmm. in this similar vein. So uh, let's see when that comes about. But uh, I'm glad to hear that you enjoyed the book, and thank you so much for having me here. Well, absolutely, the pleasure was all ours, and we look forward to your. Uh, upcoming book whenever that happens we'll keep an eye out yes. for that as well uh, Udbhav and uh, thank you so much again for coming and sharing all these lovely stories on the Musafir stories thank you so much thank you so much sir that was yet another great episode on the Musafir stories make sure to show us some love by sharing the podcast with your friends and family we are on Instagram and Twitter at Musafir stories if you like this podcast, don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the IVM network. You can listen to us on the IVM podcast app or the website. Follow us on our social media. We are at IVM Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. Hey, everybody. It's been another great week on the IVM Podcast Network. On The Habit Coach, Ashton talks to endocrinologist Dr. Altama Sheikh. They discuss the various triggers for thyroid diseases and ways to keep our bodies safe from hypothyroidism. On Misconduct, we mean Unni Yarcha, legendary warrior of Malayalam literature. Rangvi and Nisha tell us how she took revenge against the man who killed her brother. On Press Decode, Sarah Bagda and Prafula talk about illegal immigrations with reference to the Indian family that died while crossing the U.S.-Canada border. On Ikatuka Economy, Avinav and Dr. Junjunwala discuss the MSP farm law and its repercussions. And on Say No to Drama, Chetna tells us how we can make peace with the bad habits we just can't seem to quit. Also, just one quick announcement for everybody. We would like you to check out the new version of our Android app. It's available on the Play Store. It's a really interesting take on how to listen to podcasts. Do give it a look and let us know what you think. We're open to feedback on all of our social media channels. We're IBM Podcasts on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Also, do remember if you're enjoying this show or any of our other shows for that matter, please do tell a friend. Word of mouth really does help. And don't forget to rate us on any of the platforms you're listening to us on. And you can also check us out on YouTube. And we have a number of channels there at ivmpodcast.com slash YouTube, where you can take a look at them. And finally, we'd like to thank our sponsors this week, Bank of Baroda and Coinswitch Coubert. Thank you so much for making this possible. Namaste, this is Cyrus Brocha. I'm part of the government cancel culture program to remove rubbish off all the different streams available. So what we have is all the collected rubbish we put together on our show. It's called Cyrus Says. It's on IVM Podcast. You have to watch it and listen to it. It's on our app. It's on our website. It's on the YouTube channel. It's on Facebook. There are many different ways. Don't bother me and ask me how. Uh, you have to find out. We talk to different personalities. Many of them are known. Some are just people we meet downstairs and invite them up for chai. But the point is, it's fun and it's very therapeutic. So please join in and listen to Cyrus Says.